ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲೋರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ but i knew for sure that some of my tears were for the sheer helplessness that i knew my father and my uncle were feeling physically they may have traveled a small distance from the muslim mohalla to an upper class hindu colony but emotionally they had traveled the distance of a lifetime in the family comprising six brothers and four sisters these two men had most visibly shed their ghettoized muslim identities they were at home in the social cultural and economic life of agra hobnobbing with the who's who of the city and yet when it came to communal division they were nothing but muslims forever suspects forever scapegoats you just heard author and journalist ghazala wahab read an excerpt from her book born a muslim Who are the Indian Muslims? Are they a monolithic community practicing a faith alien to India? Or are they a diverse people geographically rooted in the cultural ethos of the land? Is there an Indian Islam? In this episode of Biasi Talks, Ghazala is in conversation with historian Raj Mohan Gandhi as they attempt to take a clear-eyed look at every aspect of Islam in India today. weaving together personal memoir history reportage scholarship and interviews with a wide variety of people ghazala's book highlights how an apathetic and sometimes hostile government attitude and prejudice at all levels of society have contributed to muslim vulnerability and insecurity this conversation is an extract from a bic streams event which took place on september 8th 2021 and now over to mr gandhi thank you lekha thank you very much uh, and i offer my greetings to everybody who is viewing and joining this uh, conversation and i want to say to gazala ji that this is an original significant pioneering contribution this book well done gazala ji one major take away from this how little we know of the injuries daily caused to fellow indians there's also another uh, important though minor point that i want to mention about the book zalaji that your explanations and footnotes in the book are very helpful uh, since uh, even people with goodwill are very poorly informed and unfamiliar with urdu words that are in common use your footnotes are extremely helpful so among many things i thank you for those as well now your book has a wide range you give your family story you also give the story of india's diverse muslims you write about different sects and movements in indian islam including tablighi jamaat jamaat e islami you write about the insecurities of india's muslims you write about women in indian islam you write about muslims in india's politics before i ask you a few questions let me for the sake of viewers summarize part of the family story that you tell your grandfather involved in wood and carpentry work is the leading figure much respected living in a crowded settlement outside agra city then he moves with his joint family to a settlement within agra city your father st- stops his studies after class 8 in school and does very well in the shoe business and he moves with his wife and children into a house he builds in an elite area in agra he is the only muslim living in that area with successful mostly high caste hindus now agra's leading figures officers officials come constantly to your home to eat to drink to socialize you go to college in delhi uh, you are the only muslim in your college class in delhi in 1986 your grandfather this venerated figure dies in your father's new home now while you are in your teens from 1990 onwards your world changes your family and india's muslim muslim community become insecure fear replaces hope and confidence and because of the tension sparked by advani's 1990 yatra in a toyota rath against the babri masjid and for a ram mandir 
you are summoned to Agra, your home there is attacked. When you are there in the home, your father gives you a set of telephone numbers and you dial furiously. No one answers or does anything. The family car in the compound is just destroyed. Luckily, the mob does not enter your house. Meanwhile, the inner city settlement where your uncles and aunts live is attacked. Uncles of yours are arrested with your parents. You go to the settlement. You see the scene and you cry. So now I want you to read a paragraph from page 28 of your book about what happens. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for these wonderful words that you have said about the book and agreeing to this conversation. I'm really, really overwhelmed. So this paragraph is, but I knew for sure that some of my tears were for the sheer helplessness that I knew my father and my uncle were feeling. Physically, they may have traveled a small distance from the Muslim Mohalla to an upper class Hindu colony, but emotionally, they had traveled the distance of a lifetime. In the family comprising six brothers and four sisters, these two men had most visibly shed their ghettoized Muslim identities. They were at home in the social, cultural, and economic life of Agra, hobnobbing with the who's who of the city. And yet, when it came to communal division, they were nothing but Muslims, forever suspects, forever scapegoats. Thank you, Ghazalaji. <clears throat> Those who attacked these uncles of yours, were any cases registered against the attackers? Uh, no, they, it was the PAC, the Provincial Armed Constabulary, yeah. and uh, uh, nothing ever happens uh, against the police. So the it's police hard. itself was uh, attacking, and of course nothing happened. Uh, because but, anything, any action would lead to demoralization of the forces. So that has been a standard response to any action or accountability for our law enforcement forces, unfortunately. So uh, this is 1990, and then, of course, the Babri Masjid demolition of December 1992. Tell us about that. You're in your home, you watched it on TV. Again, uh, I was... Or, uh, studying in Delhi, but because the, of the growing tension, I was called back uh, home and all the family, we had kind of huddled in our television room and we were watching the proceedings uh, on television. Uh, BBC was showing it live at that time. And uh, at some point, it seemed that there will be just a lot of speeches and nothing more would uh, happen. And at that point, I left and I went to the study and then I, instead of wasting my time watching nothing but speeches, I just spend some time in the study. And then suddenly my mother called out my name and said, hey, come, uh, just come down and see what is happening. And on the television screen, I just saw this uh, uh, a cloud of dust. And uh, my uncle was talking to somebody on the phone and he said, hey, Masjid Gir uh, the mosque has fallen. And uh, I was completely uh, shocked because uh, I, I didn't believe something like this would actually happen. Uh, it was, uh, it's not just uh, the violence of that, in which, uh, you know, people clawing it, climbing on, uh, on the dome and pulling it down uh, brick by brick. It was the whole sentiment that uh, in the full view of, uh, you know, the who's who of the political uh, leadership, uh, the police and the paramilitary, their army and the standby a little distance away. And uh, something like this has been allowed to happen. So, so it's easy to say betrayal. Uh, it's a sense of betrayal. But I think more than that, what we or what I personally felt was complete shock and um, fear that if something like this is allowed to happen, uh, what more would be allowed to happen? I mean, where will this kind of mob stop? Uh, so I think that, that is how I felt at that point. Uh, I, I think uh, many uh, uh, students of our times would say that December 6, 1992 was when something fundamental happened to, to India, sadly. <clears throat> now, going back to the 1990 incident when uh, these uh, police officers and others who enjoyed your family's hospitality, were, they were unreachable when you really needed them. Did any of them afterwards express regret uh, for, for their failure to help? No, no, it was completely brushed uh, under 
the carpet and actually we my family also never brought it up again because um there was so much of humiliation involved in that uh, um, incident yeah. i mean so it was best that nobody spoke about it again many people have already forgotten the historical significance of agra that agra was the capital of mughal hindustan for a for a considerable period uh, and uh, taj mahal is not the, not the only place there are some fantastic historical monuments in agra everybody knows that and then your grandfather in his settlement and then he, your father has successful shoe business so two things one tell us a little bit about your grandfather if you feel like and then tell us also about uh, today's state of the shoe business and uh, leather business in agra and in up you know late 60s early 70s uh, because of a very good relationship with the uh, soviet union the shoe trade to the eastern bloc uh, the entire eastern bloc was like all other trade was done through government to government agreements so there were no private business people involved in it so any business person who wanted to export had to get himself or herself registered with the government organization which was trade trading organization so my grandfather he was a completely illiterate person and uh, he used to work in one of the shoe factories in agra which were which was a uh, exporter and uh, he uh, was a weekly wager so uh, whenever he used to get the weekly wage he used to put his thumb imprint on the receipt book uh, to act, to acknowledge that he has received his wage but when my father had to drop out of school and join uh, uh, his father uh, to supplement the family income uh, he he didn't want to uh, either write his name in urdu or hindi or put his thumb imprint and uh, his desire was to do so in english so that is how he started teaching himself english and the first thing he did was how to write his name or how to sign his name in english and he and he used to go to a local munshi who was affiliated with the factory and that's how he started teaching himself to read and write english language so he's entirely self taught so th- th- this is uh, a little bit of the family background and because of my father's diligence and his uh, obsession to learn he was um, amongst the uh, very early people in agra who learned how to design a pattern who, who learned how to cut a pattern usually what happens is the country which is buying footwear from you they give you a, not only a sample but they give you the way that sample has to be made you know a foot a shoe comprises several components so each component has to be cut in a part of has to be cut on a piece of paper and then it is copied on leather so my father was one of the very early people who not only learned how to do this in agra but mastered it to an extent that whenever some a very complex piece of footwear would come and nobody would be able to do it people from different factories would approach him and ask him to do it that is how he got himself registered with state trading corporation and very senior people there director uh, he kind of discovered my father's talent and he said why don't you work with us directly and that's how he started his factory and started supplying material to stc which was uh, further exported and over a period of time he became a direct exporter to soviet union and gdr you know, poland you know the entire eastern bloc and uh, over a period of time he you know there was a period about few years in the early 80s when he was the biggest exporter to the eastern bloc from india and uh, he was felicitated by the president then he did some very complex footwear designs long boots for women for which he also got a award a national award for designing so he had completely self made self tutored and uh, he managed to create this wonderful life for himself and his children gave us these opportunities that i could come out of agra study in delhi and uh, eventually pursue a career and i want to say that through this conversation with you just now we are also uh, saluting the achievements of your father and your grandfather and your father's story your family story has so many f- fabulous landmarks and some very sad milestones also 
but I, I, through, through this conversation, we are also uh, expressing our respect for their remarkable achievements. Now, moving away from your family's story, uh, because you write about so many challenges and issues faced by the Muslim community across India. You speak of the varieties of India's Muslims, the Sayyids, the Sheikhs, the Pathans, and the rest. Uh, and you give glimpses of Muslims all across India. But this also is something I wonder whether you would like to say a bit more on this because many uh, Hindus and even others uh, think that the Muslims of India are sort of a homogenous community of a particular kind, but there are so many incredible varieties of Muslims in every state of India. So would you like to say a word about the variety and the diversity of India's Muslims? You know, Muslims worldwide are diverse, but that worldwide diversity is just accentuated even more in India. Because in India, apart from the fact that we have Shia Sunni, within the Sunnis, we have Sheikh, Sayyid, you know, these, this is a class hierarchy. Uh, then amongst the Shia, you have um, uh, Kojas, you have Smileys, and you have, uh, the, you know, what are called the Twelvers. So these are universal uh, divisions. But within that, then we have things like uh, people with a uh, Deobandi persuasion, people with a Barilvi persuasion. Then we have people, you know, the North Indian Muslims, they are completely different from Muslims in West Bengal or Muslims in Gujarat or the Muslims in South India. And I think this diversity comes not only from the fact that they live in these different regions, but also their acquaintance with the religion itself. There are the Muslims in uh, the southern part of India, they became they converted to Islam because of their exposure to the Arab traders. Uh, a lot of them had intermarriages with Arabs because Arab men traders would come here, settle down here, marry local women. So that was their exposure and that is how they, that is where the peculiarity uh, comes from. Muslims in the northern parts of India, they, they kind of trace their lineage from uh, you know, Turks, partly from Central Asian people, partly from the Persians. Then plus there are there's a lot of conversion which happened here. So all of this has created a very diverse community, not only diverse, but very distinguishable from each other. You can uh, actually look at a Muslim in Kashmir and uh, say that he's a Kashmiri, not because of his accent, but even in the manner in which he practices or she practices uh, the religion or a Muslim from uh, Kerala, again, you, because of the way, the specific way of the practice, the specific attire they wear, which is a mix of uh, the local as well as a little bit of Arab influence, which has, which continues to this day. So I think it's a very, very lively uh, sort of a community if you look at it with an open mind and not uh, through prejudiced uh, classes. I'm glad you mentioned the fact uh, of the Arabs coming in the 8th, 9th centuries, you know, the notion that Islam came to India with the sword, but the Arabs who traded in the 8th, 9th centuries with South India, with both coasts, both the Western coast and the Eastern coast and settled there and their descendants are still there. Uh, so as you point out, uh, there is an incredible and rich diversity. And then the Muslims of Assam, Muslims of Bengal, uh, Muslims of UP Bihar. That, I mean, every state of India has a distinct Muslim identity. So the question is this, that uh, how do India's Hindus, and actually Muslims too, and secularists and pluralists, get to know the Muslim reality? We are not just politically or ideologically polarized. We lead separate, segregated, uninformed lives, even illiterate lives. So I know that your book will help a lot. And I hope that more films and more documentaries will be created. But I just want you to reflect on this need we have, that we need to get to know one another more closely and more accurately. Before the partition, uh, we didn't have, I mean, there were instances of uh, violence and uh, communal violence, but the communities lived together in a very organic way. We didn't have these huge mega cities. So in a village, there was so much of interdependence on each other. In small towns, people just lived together, Muslims, Hindus, uh, uh, and they depended on each other for economic reasons, for social reasons. So they knew, understood each other better. But as we moved into uh, you know, the modern times and we built these mega cities, 
there was so much of insecurity, I think, even amongst uh, Hindus, that they preferred to stick to their own kinds. They preferred to stay with their own type of people. So um, a group of uh, Bengalis would prefer living only with other Bengalis. This kind of insularity pushed Muslims really away from the mainstream because the less you got to know them, more you feared them. And the more you feared them, more you wanted to push them out of the mainstream. The consequence today is that any kind of kanat, any kind of most unbelievable stories about a Muslim is believed and believed widely by people. They don't even wonder that um, how is this possible that somebody so beastly, somebody so ghastly has been living in India and yet we are all safe. So uh, they, this is the, the reason for this is because they don't know Muslims. They, there aren't many Muslims in the mainstream now. And whenever there are a few, uh, because of all this that is happening in the last few years, uh, the rumor mongering, the specific targeting of the poor, and actually the both, the biggest ambassadors of any community are the poor because these are the people for economic reasons they they migrate from place to place they go out to work they, they are coming into your houses to do your odd jobs they are they are selling vegetables outside your fancy uh, apartments gated colonies so th they are the biggest ambassadors of their own community now if they are targeted they have to assume false identities only to be able to you know pedal uh, or uh, do their work there, uh, that, that sort of marginalization has most dangerous consequences for any society which is as diverse as ours. If you're pushing 15% uh, uh, or 18% of your population out of your national mainstream, you're making them economically so vulnerable that they're not even able to contribute to your economic development. You are basically standing your own self. You're you're actually in, impending on your own, as the saying goes. You're actually putting your own leg on the axe. You're hurting yourself, and in the bargain, you are creating this fear about the other so much that this fear will debilitate your own children, your own environment, and foster more insecurity. Thank you, Ghazal I, I, I was interested that you write that when you were in college in Delhi, you were perhaps the only Muslim in your college class, and your uh, non-Muslim classmates showed no curiosity while you were there to know from you more about your lives or Muslim lives. So I think this too is a very interesting reality today, that even when there are some Muslims available close to us, next to us, we don't take the opportunity to really get, get to know them. So this, I think this creation of knowledge and familiarity, and, and I hope more people will, will learn from your example, you write your story, and that more, uh, more of us, whatever our religion or background, that we will really get to know our fellow Indians who live close to us and what the, the attacks they face on their bodies, on their, on their sentiments people living only a few yards away from us, but we know nothing about them. And I think this is true even of many who have sympathy for the Muslims or empathy for Muslims, but they don't have knowledge. They, they don't have information. So this is uh, something which where your book is helping a lot. Now, changing slightly uh, subject, you have provised, provided in your book a summarized history of early Islam in the Arab world. Uh, not so much the Islam, say, of Iran or Islam of Turkey, which are also very important in the world. But I think a, a calmer, more objective discussion of history can also be useful. And of course, discussion of partition in India, why it happened, what partition actually was. You know, so many Hindus have convinced themselves that when partition took place, it was the duty of all the Muslims of India to migrate to Pakistan. That was, of course... Nobody agreed, said that. That was not the agreement when partition was accepted by everybody, sadly or unhappily by many, enthusiastically by many on both sides. Nobody at that point said, neither the British nor the Congress nor the Muslim League nor the Akalis, that all the Muslims of India had to go to Pakistan. It was not as if 
there was one Muslim nation being created and one Hindu nation being created. Muslim majority areas were allowed to separate and form a separate country. So, so at some stage, I hope that we will have a calm discussion about the history of partition. But uh, this is mo more an observation from me, uh, uh, sparked by some of, your, some of your writings. Now, I want to mention one other thing. You mentioned that there was a time when relations at the grassroots were more cordial. However, let us also remember that in the 1947 terrible killings, which the vast majority of the killings in that particular year took place in Punjab on both sides. In, in the Western Punjab, Hindus and Sikhs uh, were brutally killed by Muslims. In East Punjab, Muslims were brutally killed by Hindus and Sikhs on a very large scale. And the British before leaving, they had a very small and not very efficient, but uh, quite remarkable boundary force led by one or two English people. And there were Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs in that small force, they tried uh, their best. Now, in the, when you read the history of that boundary force and its work, you discover that during that time when this boundary force was expected to control the situation in Punjab, not a single Muslim fired a shot at any Muslim attacker. Not a single Hindu or Sikh fired a shot at a Hindu or Sikh attacker. These were all part of the British-led Punjab boundary force. So there was, uh, so in the past also, while there have been some wonderful uh, coexistence, friendship, participation, and there was also this very sad sentiment. So equally, we also know, and you know, I've uh, had a chance to make research on the story of Punjab, not just the 47 killings, but even the early killings. And on the 47 killings, all those who have read and interviewed people know that yes, killings were brutal and terrible, but the number of people who saved their fellows was a much larger number. Those who protected their fellows outnumbered those who were attacking their fellows. So from history, we can also take uh, this. Uh, so anyway, uh, now, as you were mentioning in earlier decades, uh, before, say, before December 6, 1992, uh, there was uh, another atmosphere. In earlier years, we had Gandhi, we had Nehru, we had a secular government. The media was not controlled by the majoritarians, even if, if the police didn't always protect those who were attacked. Uh, let us not imagine that these attacks on minorities only took place after the BJP came to power. Many, you know, in UP and elsewhere, some very sad attacks had taken place. But then there was a time when there were influential Muslim cabinet ministers, because not only Maulana Azad, many others. Uh, there were Muslim presidents, there were Muslim chief ministers of states. Uh, today, they control the climate all in majoritarian hands. So this is a tough reality. Have you any reflection on this reality? As far as politics is concerned, this is the worst time uh, for a Muslim because they are completely irrelevant to our, uh, the democratic process in India. Whether they vote or they don't vote, nothing happens. Nothing changes or nothing will change. Because the way the, the narrative has shaped, the moment there is... Anybody who's raising the voice for a Muslim or talking about any Muslim issue, everybody else immediately converges on the opposite side. That uh, So uh, what we see now is this uh, a majoritarian, uh, a creation of the majoritarian vote bank. So I think in terms of politics, it's, it's, it's a very, very bad situation in India as far as Muslims are concerned. The only hope I see and maybe uh, things will improve is that the majoritarian uh, themselves, they, they, they should understand, they should be empathetic towards uh, everybody, including the Muslims, and they should address their issues. Uh, in any case, uh, the expectations from the government uh, for any community is that they should have a uh, share of the, you know, the government's largest of, of whatever opportunities that the government is, uh, offers to the citizens. Uh, they, they should have equal uh, access to that. And they should have justice. If they are wrong in some way or some wrong has happened to them, they, they should be, you know, fair trial and they should be given justice. Both of these are not happening under the present uh, circumstances, especially in certain states of the country where BJP is in power. 
are and where they are in uh, where the opposition is extremely weak so we have instances in northern states where a muslim has been attacked on false charges and the case is filed by the police the charge sheet is filed against the muslim so a, a lot of such things are happening so I, i think the difference between now and the earlier times is earlier times people may have harbored the um, prejudice against one another uh, muslims may have had prejudice against uh, hindus and hindus may have had prejudice against muslims but this was not part of civil society this was not part of polite society people would not talk about this openly they keep it within themselves or they just talk about this among uh, their core family of very close friends uh, network because it was considered impolite to talk about this it was considered bad behavior to tell a muslim on her face that you are a terrorist or you are whatever this boundary has been crossed now now it's no longer impolite to actually accuse somebody of the worst things possible the worst things you could imagine and you know when even when you're accusing the other person you know that this is not true you know it cannot be true because your own experience your lived in experience of the last uh, so many decades your experience of your forefathers everything tells you that uh, the accusation that you're making is not correct but you do not hesitate to make this because now uh, there is no punitive action one that happens against you or which is uh, uh, you're not punished for doing this the other thing is it has become acceptable it's mainstream now that you can say anything and nobody will judge you for your choice of words for your conduct on the contrary maybe this can benefit you if you have if you aspire for a political career so the more vicious you are maybe uh, further you will go politically so i think this is the major difference between what used to happen pre 1990 and now as a society we are becoming less civil uh, less dignified now uh, on this of course uh, those who follow what's happening in the world know that this is not exclusively an indian story all over the world there is this notion now uh, you know earlier there was a notion that all of humanity is one uh, all of humanity is one but now there is a notion that some that countries belong more to one lot of people than to others america belongs to the whites afghanistan belongs to the pashtuns iran belongs to the shia india belongs to the hindus and so this notion that non hindus are somehow second class citizens is fortunately not yet part of our constitution it is absolutely not and even today in, in this altered and very often depressing atmosphere we find judges we find uh, journalists we find others reminding the indian nation of what the constitution says about equality that india is everybody's country an atheist a communist uh, a muslim shia sunni hindus of all kinds sadi six dalits christians everybody buddhist jains india belongs to, to to us all so that is the reality still today and every now and then you know there is also some encouraging news uh, the election results of west bengal in may were fantastic results i mean imagine the propaganda that was unleashed and the resources behind that propaganda that juggernaut that heavily financed <laughs> juggernaut could do nothing and this woman with her injured foot she won and you know even today in punjab where which has seen terrible terrible things there is today in indian punjab an amazing feeling among sikhs and hindus that we should have a better relationship with the muslims even the better relationships with the people of pakistan government is one thing but with the people of pakistan so there is bengal in the east there is punjab in the west there is kerala in the south there is tamil nadu in the south so despite uh, the the grim scene that you are looking at the grim scene that i am looking at there also are some rather positive things happening and i will repeat what i have said before that if only those of us who have experienced something 
whether positive or negative, but something that is deeply, that affects us, we should record it. We should write it down. We should share it. Uh, we should make films or documentaries. Or, I, I wish, you know, I, I, I'm old and I'm completely unlearned in all this technology, but I envy those who can. But this is what I would say that your example should be followed. And more of us should just enable fellow Indians to know the facts and let the facts lead us where they may. So now I want you to give your thoughts uh, to, to three different groups of people in any way and take your time with this. So those, whether they are Muslims or Hindus or whatever in India, who are say on your side or on my side, on the side of equality, on the side of humanity, on the side of the Indian constitution, uh, who believe in an India that belongs equally to all, that everyone has equal rights. What should people like us do in your opinion and how can we do better? So first, I want your comment on this. I, I, and I'll answer this in two parts. Uh, one is uh, express hope and gratitude for everybody who is still holding on to this idea of uh, India being a, a secular, inclusive uh, country and who's struggling every day, at the, even uh, to great danger to their own lives, to ensure that it stays like that, whether coming out on roads and streets and protesting, whether writing articles or books or uh, on social media. So all of this is building some sort of a reservoir from which everybody can draw strength from. So I, I think uh, that, that is my first part of my answer. My other part is a little bit of um, grouse. And that grouse is that a lot of well-meaning people also sometimes they try and draw false equivalences. And, and maybe they, they mean well, but they are uh, uh, they probably do not understand enough or they just want to play it safe and ensure that they, they remain equidistant. So if they want to uh, criticize, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the radical Hindus, then uh, in the same way, they have to immediately criticize uh, radical Muslims. The problem with this is that the situation or the circumstances of radical Hindus or radical Muslims are very different. So if you have to attack radicalization or radicalism in the society, you have to see the source of it. You have to attack the source of it. Uh, the, the behavior, the public behavior or public posturing, a radical public posturing is a consequence or it's a manifestation of the cause which has been lying unattended. So just drawing an equivalence and thinking that your job is done, I think it's, it's not correct. There could be some very serious reasons why a lot of young uh, Hindu people are uh, disillusioned with the Muslims. They feel they have been cheated by Muslims. They feel that over a period of time, Muslims have been appeased by government after government at the cost of the Hindus. If this is the source of their grievance, and if this is the cause which is making them radical or to, uh, turning them into uh, less civil people, then this needs to be addressed. They have to be told that what you think is correct or not correct or why things have happened the way they have happened. Similarly, the Muslim uh, who are getting radicalized or who are radical at the moment, you need to understand where is this radicalization coming from? Is this a factor that they have been wronged by the law enforcement agencies? Is this a factor they have been discriminated against in some areas? Is, is it because there is some fancy notion of global ummah that they have? So, so unless you target the cause, you cannot address this uh, problem. So I think when we are talking about, uh, and liberals actually do tend to do this. I mean, when you're talking of, for instance, uh, in recent times, a lot of people have been criticizing the RSS. So many liberals just immediately tend to say, okay, so RSS is bad, Taliban are bad. Now, RSS is here in India. Well, what RSS does will have impact here on our lives, both Hindus, Muslims, everybody. What Taliban is doing in Afghanistan will have impact on their lives, on very unfortunate, but it doesn't impact on our everyday life of uh, people here. 
in a long convoluted way well yes terrorism can come here so but that is right now not in the control of ordinary citizens i mean i cannot do anything to stop them but i can do something to stop a, a indian muslim from thinking that he or she needs to pick up arms against the state i can do that so i think i should be doing that instead of brushing this under the carpet and or brushing the rss under the carpet because i don't want to talk about the muslim so these false equivalences are damaging us more than we realize and it is perpetuating perpetuating the myths about muslims in india these are very helpful points very clarifying points you know that uh, some white nationalists in the united states when they face criticism about their racism about the situation of african americans in the united states they say look at the way in some parts of africa some african governments are treating treating some africans uh, they are enslaving africans they claim so uh, what you say is so true that merely because some africans in africa are treating fellow africans badly does not give white america the right to oppress african americans in america so as you point out if muslims in afghanistan or elsewhere are treating fellow muslims or minorities or women badly that does not give others the right to oppress people uh, where they are and there's one other point i would like to add on this there is such a thing as honor such a thing as gallantry if a huge majority oppresses a minority and the state forces police or whatever of the majority oppress the minority where is the bravery in it where is the honor in it so uh, i think that you those are very important points you make about false equivalences uh, thank you so much so now my next question uh, the first one was your message to secularists and liberals now what is your message to fellow muslims and to other muslim women in india i think this is my favorite part <laughs> they should not only learn about their own religion they should also learn about their own history the reason they should learn about their own religion and learn it from uh, on their own through proper uh, sources and not rely on the mullahs is because when somebody tells them misleads them and say that this is islamic this is not islamic they should be able to answer that person back that uh, i know what my religion is about so with problem with majority of muslims in india today and i'm not using the word majority casually i'm using it very uh, consciously is that they have mortgaged their own faith to a very small group of clergy so islam doesn't have a sunni islam doesn't have a concept of clergy but we have created because we do not want to take responsibilities for our own action we don't have confidence in our own practice of faith so we need to constantly uh, validate it from somebody who we think would know better than us so i think the first thing they need to do is learn about their own religion learn it correctly so that they are able to answer somebody who tells them that what you're doing is un-islamic they should be able to reason and rationalize their behavior and take responsibility for it the other thing is they should learn about their history not only the history in india but actually the history of islam the way it uh, the reason it uh, spread in arabia and the uh, uh, neighboring places so fast and what was a message what was the principal purpose of islam and which moved so many people to convert this uh, notion that they were post conversions actually takes away from the uh, core message there was obviously something about the message of islam something which appeals to a large number of people who converted who were influenced or moved by it uh, and that is how it spread so rapidly so what was that message that message was not that you have to pray five times a day or you have to uh, practice your religion uh, only through dogmatic behavior uh, the message was of egalitarianism the message was of, of equality not only between uh, fellow human beings but between genders the message was of justice of fair play so th- these are the things they need to understand and they will if they read this they will also understand that they need not be apologetic for the conduct 
correct con conduct or imagined conduct of their forefathers in india i mean some may have been terrible people and some may have been very good but the present day muslim they need not be apologetic about them it's not their responsibility uh, what has happened in the past thank you so uh, the last question in this and then before after that i'll just offer a couple of sentences this is the last question to you if you were to meet prime minister modi or home minister amit shah what would you say to them imagine that they are listening to this well, we should believe we should believe that this discussion is so interesting that they are also watching so what will you say to shri modi and shri shah you know mr modi has claimed that uh, he is a strong man and he is creating a strong secure india but the truth is uh in a 75 year old history we have never been as insecure as we are today uh we are insecure on our borders whether it's with china or pakistan we are insecure inside the country for the first time the majority community in india despite this overwhelming numbers despite their fellow or co religionists being in position of power whether it's law enforcement or judiciary or politics despite everything they still feel Fright, uh, frightened. There, there, there is a sense of insecurity, even, uh, despite all this. So, where is this insecurity coming from? Obviously, this insecurity is being manufactured, peddled day in, day out, and this fear psychosis will not benefit the country in the long run. A nation which is so fearful of its own shadow really cannot progress. So, what I would like to say to both of them is. that if you have to restore the confidence of the people in their own lives you have to take away this fear you have to tell them or you have to show by your actions that what they fear is nothing but a shadow and you have to remove that so uh, without that we cannot really go anywhere further in life we we are constantly looking everybody i mean it's not just muslims even hindus everybody is constantly looking behind their shoulders our borders are not secure we are hunting for uh, uh, enemies within our own communities our own societies we are we are regressing in our thought in our attitudes in our approach to life and the more we remain insecure more stop thinking uh, clearly we'll stop uh, relying on scientific way of uh, approaching life we'll become more and more conservative in terms of religion in terms of our social behavior we'll become more superstitious we'll start believing in everything and uh, no nation can progress thank you thank you analogy <laughs> for these reflections thank you for this fantastic book thank you very so much. much i would say in conclusion you write in your final lines you write that islam's central purpose should be to invest people with nobility with virtuousness with large heartedness among other things and quote so my only response is to say let us hope that followers preachers gurus teachers of all religions will ask for nobility for virtuousness and large heartedness from those who listen to them thank you so much thank you so much thank you for hanging in there and listening to the full conversation if you liked what you heard do share it with friends and family you can also leave us a review or rating on itunes and apple podcasts the crew behind this podcast is god of krishna on sound supervision and production with support from s sarana raj and rahu tankaila Episode artwork and design is by Chandni Venkatraman. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.